Hello, everyone. It's so great. There's so many friends um, and people I know from Facebook that are in this group. And um, it's good to see you. And I see from the chat, we have someone from Vancouver, Canada. So that's wonderful as well that you could visit us here on this particular format. So I am the co-chair of the Imagine Little Tokyo Short Story Contest with Mia Iwataki, who's also um, here on the Zoom. Um, so this is gonna be the format. Actually, this is gonna be, this is our eighth annual contest. And um, on our inaugural year, what myself and Bill Watanabe, who's an icon of Little Tokyo, everybody knows who he is. Um, and he is also a member of the, and this is all under the Little Tokyo Historical Society, and which is led by Mike Okamura, who I believe is also on the Zoom. So, um, and Bill is a faithful a member of this particular group. So what Bill and I did was when we could actually meet together, we went to the Little Tokyo Public Library and Bill actually gave a physical tour. From there, we went through Little Tokyo and Bill gave us all these wonderful little details that people could integrate in their story. And afterwards, we had a very brief um, writing workshop. So we're assimilating that here today. Of course, it's only for an hour, so there's so much we can do. But I think the main thing is two things, is kind of to spark your imagination, help you to travel. And the other thing is to just be excited. And what I always tell people, a lot of people have an editor that's on their shoulder, and I'm a former editor. Right now, you want to knock that editor off. You don't want anybody telling you, oh, that's no good. You just want to be free and open. So this is a free and open space today. So, um, and I, oh, yes. And I want everybody, this is very old school. So I don't know if you could find a pen and a piece of paper somewhere, but find that. And I want you to kind of take notes while you're listening to Bill. And then we're going to have a very brief exercise for you to do as well. Um, and if you have any questions along the way, just put it in the chat. And I think Joy or uh, Yoko will help me dig those out and we'll try to answer them if we can. Um, so without further ado, um, let me see if I could share my screen here. So um, Bill will be able to take you on a tour. Um, and Bill Watanabe is the former executive director of the Little Tokyo Service Center and uh, just a great supporter and lover of Little Tokyo. So, Bill, um, take it away. Thank you, Naomi. Uh, welcome to everybody. It's uh, great that we have uh, over 40 folks uh, participating in this. So I'm hoping we'll get a lot of uh, good stories. Um, some of you uh, I know are quite familiar with Little Tokyo and others of you may not be quite so familiar. So I'm going to give a very basic uh, kind of an introductory tour of some of the places and locations in Little Tokyo that you may want to uh, base your story around and uh, let your creative juices flow to see what might be an interesting story. Now, Little Tokyo began around 1884, uh, the first Japanese person to uh, open a business on First Street uh, was a, a guy named, uh, well, he took the name Charles Kame. So he opened a restaurant uh, right where Bunkado gift shop is and uh, apparently did pretty well. Uh, and in a couple of years, he sold his business, made money, and people heard that uh, there's a place in L.A. where Japanese can do uh, a good business. And so uh, that attracted a lot of folks to start coming down uh, or coming into Little Tokyo. And it, and it grew rather quickly. Uh, and so by, say, 1920, there were uh, tens of thousands of Japanese, maybe 20, 25,000 Japanese living in and around that First Street, San Pedro, uh, area where there were shops set up, uh, offices, boarding houses, hotels. Uh, and so it began to be a flourishing 
uh, identifiable, uh, identifiable ethnic neighborhood. Um, <clears throat> in uh, 1941, of course, uh, Little Tokyo uh, was uh, uh, emptied out of all of the Japanese, Japanese Americans who were incarcerated during World War II. Uh, and so it became uh, overnight, practically, an African-American community called Bronzeville. <clears throat> and then after World War II ended, Japanese started to come back uh, to Little Tokyo. African-Americans had other options of places where they could live. And so they started to move out. Uh, and so there was a re resettlement phase to Little Tokyo, which brings us to today. Now, uh, what you see here is the Japanese village plaza with the fire tower uh, in the background. I always thought that the fire tower might be an interesting place to start a story or have a story. People meet there. It's probably one of the most visible icons of Little Tokyo. Uh, I'm, I'm always thinking like, gee, uh, if this might be a good place for lovers to, to <laughs> connect or a first date or a blind date or uh, an internet date or something. But uh, the fire tower and and uh, Japanese Village Plaza is very bright, very colorful, uh, and uh, could be a, a, a good scene for a story. Next. This is the uh, Union Center for the Arts, or uh, formerly the uh, Union Church of Los Angeles. This was the original location of the church, built around 1923, uh, the first Christian church in Little Tokyo. Uh, the church uh, moved to another site in the 1970s, uh, and then uh, 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 near the end of the 1980s, uh, 1990, uh, it became the Union Center for the Arts, which houses the East West Players Theater, Visual Communications, and LA Art Corps. And so now it's a, a visual arts center. Uh, again, there's a lot of history to that building. Uh, some people say there are ghosts that might occupy that space. Uh, when the church was operating back in the 20s and 30s, they taught culture classes for new immigrants from Japan coming to uh, L.A. People were married there. People had their funeral services there. Uh, and so it represents another aspect of the community. Uh, the lower picture that you see, it is now... Uh, uh, there's something going on uh, called Tuesday night at the cafe where people can do uh, <clears throat> uh, open mic performances of music or poetry or writing. Uh, if you write a short story, you might even want to share your short story at the Tuesday night at the cafe. So, uh, <clears throat> next is uh, the Chop Suey Far East building. Uh, there were at least four chop suey restaurants in Little Tokyo. Um, this is a part of the historic uh, district of Little Tokyo. It's, it's a national historic landmark. And so these exterior features will never be changed. And, uh, and although the inside might change, so currently it is no longer a chop suey restaurant. It is the far bar uh, and a sports bar. But the exterior is uh, exactly as it has been for the last um, uh, almost 100 years uh, since the building was built. Um, okay, next. <clears throat> this is the Little Tokyo mural. Uh, it's right on the corner of First and Central. Uh, it was painted by hundreds of Little Tokyo volunteers who came and uh, painted portions of the mural. And it reflects different aspects of Little Tokyo. Uh, in the right hand, bottom right hand corner, you see an African American couple dancing. Uh, you, you see the Ondo. And um, so it, it just represents different aspects of Little Tokyo, saying that Little Tokyo is a home for many. This is the Friendship Knot right at the corner of Second and San Pedro. Uh, it was built by the Community Redevelopment Agency and uh, represents uh, a knot, two strings that come together tied into a knot. 
uh, and uh, reflects the friendship between the U.S. and Japan. Uh, a little ways away from the friendship knot, uh, this is the Allison Onizuka Memorial. Uh, Allison Onizuka was uh, killed in the uh, space shuttle uh, explosion that took place and Challenger, uh, space shuttle Challenger. Um, I remember us, one of the stories that was submitted a number of years ago, it, it, it was about a, 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 an Earth person who had been living on Mars. So it takes place uh, in little Tokyo of the future. And uh, so he comes back from Mars to visit LA and he stops to look at the uh, Onizuka uh, Memorial. So uh, it was an interesting tie into Little Tokyo of today with the futuristic story of Little Tokyo, say a hundred years from now. This is the Nishihonganji Buddhist temple, the first site of the temple. Um, <clears throat> it is now a part of the Japanese American National Museum. Uh, but this was, uh, well, this is the largest Japanese Buddhist temple in the United States. Uh, it also uh, started about the same time as the uh, Union Church in the early 1920s. They moved to another location further east from here, but uh, this building also has a tremendous amount of history. This is the uh, SK Ueda and you may not be able to read the sign uh, on the street lamp there, but it says the Finale Club. And so back during the Bronzeville era, during World War II, actually just after World War II, um, there used to be a, a jazz club uh, right at the same location as the Ueda built store. And uh, at this jazz club in March of 1946, uh, Charlie Parker, one of the great uh, jazz musicians played with uh, a very young, I think about a 20 year old Miles Davis. And so Par Charlie Parker and Miles Davis performed at this site. Uh, and so a historic marker has been put up there. But again, this is a, a colorful part of uh, the history of a location. And there was tremendous amount of change from Japanese to black back to Japanese. Uh, and again, a lot of history that could be connected there a lot of potential stories that could weave in uh, different facets of, of American life. Uh, this is the JCCC Noguchi Plaza. So I'm going to uh, maybe spend about the next five minutes talking about uh, the JACCC. You see the uh, six story, it's five stories above ground and one story below. Is the uh, cultural center building where there are cultural groups and nonprofits. And uh, in the basement is the Watanabe uh, Culinary Arts Center. Uh, no relation to me, but uh, once uh, this COVID is uh, uh, over with, uh, they can start to teach classes and how to uh, prepare Japanese foods. And it also goes down into the Japanese garden. We have a picture of that that you can see later. On the left of the picture is the Aratani Theater. It seats uh, 800 people. Uh, and then you see the Noguchi Plaza. Isama Noguchi uh, was a Hapa guy, one of, the, one of the very early ones. He was born around 1900 uh, to a Japanese father and a Caucasian mother. And uh, he became, a, I, I would not be exaggerating to say a world famous artist who designed this plaza and sculptured the rocks that appear on the plaza. Uh, and so this is called Noguchi Plaza at the JACCC. Uh, the above picture is another picture of the plaza, uh, but the photo below is a grapefruit tree that is uh, on the plaza. Uh, this grapefruit tree, uh, not sure exactly how old it is, but some people believe it could be over a hundred years old and it may actually be part of the citrus grove that actually occupied the site where the JACCC is now. Uh, Southern California back in the late 1800s um, was the center of the citrus, citrus industry with uh, lemons and oranges and grapefruits. 
this happens to be a grapefruit tree and it still produces grapefruits. Uh, and um, before COVID, there used to be uh, a fundraiser where one of the local uh, uh, bars would make uh, cocktails out of the grapefruits so that people could actually drink a piece of history. Uh, but again, uh, the tree has seen so much history of Little Tokyo and uh, who knows who might have sat under the tree and uh, taken advantage of the shade that might be there or have eaten the grapefruit. So again, another possibility for an interesting story. This is the uh, Japanese garden that's at the JACCC. Uh, it was uh, built by volunteer gardeners from the Southern California Japanese Gardeners Federation. Uh, they drove up to the mountains and brought back all of these rocks and built the garden. Because uh, you're stay up all night, buddy. And that's not nice. Someone needs to uh, be put on mute, I think. Um, okay, next. All right, so that is uh, the end of my presentation. Uh, I, I sh probably should have included a photo of the brand new, recently completed Terasaki Budokan. Uh, the Budokan has yet to open because of COVID, but uh, at some point it could be also uh, an interesting starting point or story that could be woven around sports or martial arts uh, and that kind of thing. Uh, with that, though, uh, I'm going to give it back to Naomi. I'm sure most of you are eager to hear how you can improve your writing. Uh, and Naomi has some tremendous tips on how you could do that. Thank you. Hello, am I unmuted? Can you can you hear me? Uh, let's see. Let me make sure. Okay. Um, so I'm going to go back to sharing my screen. Thank you so much, Bill, for that presentation. That was really wonderful. So as you hear, just, you know, you have your piece of paper, just write little notes of what was memorable of what Bill just shared with you, because we'll be using that information in a second. So I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint. Okay. So this is the writing workshop um, portion of the presentation. We don't have much time, so I'm gonna, um, this will be just kind of some basics to help you. Um, okay, so based on what you just heard, get your piece of paper out and both Bill and Joy are gonna participate in this too. And pick one of these places that Bill described and just write a few lines about that place. It could be past tense, it could be present tense. And the only thing is, I want you to incorporate one of the five senses. When we usually describe a place, we go straight to sight, which is fine, but there's wonderful things you could do with smell, sound, taste, and touch. So take, um, so right now, um, I'm not gonna give you much time, get that piece of paper out and start writing and just um, let's enter into one of the places that Bill described and just include um, two, of one, uh, two of these five senses. So let's go, start. Okay, um, 
let's wrap it up. And then what I want you to do next is add a person, or for those of you who are into fantasy or whatever, a creature to your setting. So right now you have a setting, add a person or creature. And um, you can do that by describing that person or creature. You could have them doing some sort of action. You could do just dialogue, or you could go into inner thoughts of that person or creature. Um, you'll have to make a decision to read, uh, either do it first person, so using I, or else third person. And if you do it third person, you might have to name the person or creature. So do that now. So let's add a person. Okay, let's wrap that up and then add another person or creature to the setting. So you, right now you have the setting, you had one a per person or creature, now you, you're adding another person. And in the same way, you could do it through action, through dialogue. Now you've already made a commitment to either first person or third. So just continue with that. Okay, and stop. Um, I'm going to stop sharing. So in the chat, um, can you all uh, just, um, how was this experience? Just, just for, for those brave people, just, just um, comment in the chat. Was it easy for you? Were you stuck? You could be perfectly honest. Um, and, but in the meantime, um, Bill, I think, uh, I've asked you to be our first guinea pig. Oh, it's fun. That's good. So, um, and, and then Kevin says, I enjoyed writing without knowing where I was going. Sophia was a little stuck. That's okay. It was productive, you know, for, um, I, what I would recommend for people who are a little stuck because sometimes that means maybe your editor was on your shoulder. So try to do this maybe on a regular basis. Like just, you know, um, brainstorm. Um, and just know nobody needs to read what you just wrote. It could be your secret. So just feel free. Just feel free. And it could be that maybe, you know, none of those spots really resonated with you. And maybe you need to pick another place. You know, it could be that type of thing, too. One thing when I get stuck, um, I usually don't get writer's block that often. But when I do, I start typing, I am so stuck. I cannot think of anything to write. You know, I start typing that in. And as you keep doing that, lo and behold, something starts to take hold. So, um, yeah, don't, don't, if you feel like you have writer's block, don't fight it. Just say, I don't have, I don't have a thought. 
you know, and when you kind of admit that and take hold, then you could kind of um, enter in, enter in your imagination. Okay, so Bill, Mr. Watanabe, um, I want you to share what you've read, written, and everybody I, in the chat, if you could comment on things that you've noticed that pops out at you. So go for it, Bill. Be our brave person here. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, um, I scribble some things here. Uh, Saburo left his family and farm during the Great Depression and found himself in little Tokyo. He was surprised to see Japanese writing and he could hear Japanese spoken and smell Oden in the air. That's as far as I got. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was good. So let's see, I'm trying to see. Great first, uh, Mike Habata says great first sentence. And I, I like the, the timing you, you um, and this is what you want to do. You want to pick out a concrete details and you had a specific time, um, the Great Depression. Um, and that's like an era actually that is not really talked about much, not written about in, in terms of little, like many times we write either present day or we do World War II, you know, little before, you know, like in the 40s or um, present day. But I think, you know, that time period is very interesting. And then um, Ike says, mm, the smell of Oden, you know, signage smells of food. And so I think that, um, again, you picked a very specific detail that Oden, you could have put tempura, you could have put chicken teriyaki, but there's something special about Oden for people who know, you know, that's very um, kind of Japanese soul food, right? So I think that was really helpful. Um, I don't know if, uh, well, I'll just, I was going to have some of you, it, it, for any brave souls, if you could private chat me what you wrote, and then we may come to it at the end. So just find me, uh, my name, and, and type out what you wrote, and um, we can share it at the end. So any, if, you, if there's any brave souls out there. Okay, I'm going to continue on with my presentation. So I'm going to share the screen again. Yeah, so type into the chat to me privately, if you want to share. All right, um, for types of short stories, um, actually, Neil Gaiman is a very famous fantasy writer. And I don't know if um, Yoko or Joy, I, I have a, a link, you know, he teaches a master class on writing, I think, short stories. And he kind of defines um, the different kinds that are out there. So if um, someone could put that in the chat for a link in the chat so people can take a look. Um, one type, okay, usually most stories, this is conventional stories, um, they have uh, this general structure. They have an inciting incident. And I kind of liking it, like, you know, there's a stick of dynamite and it has a, you know, long line, you know, uh, um, to it. And you take a match and you um, light the, the stick of dynamite, the long line. And then um, that kind of starts everything. And this is from the view of the protagonist. That sets everything in motion. Okay, so that's the, what we call the inciting incident. And when you're writing a book, a novel, you know, you, you don't need to get into the inciting incident until maybe like, you know, the second chapter or the third. But in a short story, you have to get to it pretty quickly. And then it kind of climbs to, it goes to the climax when, you know, everything kind of comes to a head and then it goes down to a resolution. So that's your basic short story. But if you look at Neil Gaiman's different categories, one is like a vignette. And those, when I first started writing short stories, that was like the first type of story I wrote. Um, I remember uh, when I first, uh, when I worked at the Rafu Shimpo after graduating from college, I had written a short story called The Bath. 
because I lived in Tokyo for a year and it was a time and I didn't have a, a bathtub or shower. So I had to go to the Sento, the public bath. And it was quite an experience for me. So I wrote a short story in which a, a Hapa woman, she's waiting to hear from her boyfriend in America on the phone. He never, he doesn't call. And then she goes to the public bath. And I kind of just described all the rituals of the public bath. And she finds community in that she doesn't feel as lonely in the public bath. And then she comes home and then she hears the phone ringing, you know. But so that doesn't really have a great inciting incident. It doesn't have a lot of movement. It's more kind of a slice of life, which is fine. But, um, but that's more of a vignette. Um, now, since I write mysteries, I've really come to appreciate having the inciting incident. A lot of times it's a dead body, but you don't have to be so extreme. <laughs> and the, um, so when you want to do more research on types of short stories, I would recommend you go to our partner, Discover Nikke, and just um, type in Imagine Little Tokyo. You could see all the finalists from the past eight years. And you know what? Some of them, you're not going to like the story. And that's it's subjective. Some people like it. Some people don't. I, I don't judge any of the short stories, by the way. Um, so, um, and, and there's times where I've liked maybe the second place or third place story more than the first, but it's okay because we have a re rotating set of judges. So when you look at you know, participating in our contests, look at it this way. This is a way to push you to finish something. Because what I tell people is it, that it, it doesn't matter if you have a wonderful first chapter or second chapter. If you don't finish the, store, the book, it doesn't matter. It's better to have like a mediocre finished draft than a fantastic, you know, first two chapters. And in, in the same way, you know, with a short story, it's better to have a finished short story that needs some work than a great beginning of a short story. So, um, so let this be an a incentive for you to finish something. Okay, I'm going to go over quickly one of the, um, this is from our first year, um, just the beginning of a short story that won second place, so they didn't win first, but it's still incredibly um, memorable short story by Ruben Guevara. It's called Yuriko and Carlos. So um, let's see, I'm gonna go to here. So as I read these first three paragraphs, um, take note, what sort of senses does he touch? Is he writing in first person or third? Is there an inciting incident? And also, what about character development? Little Tokyo, 1941. As I walked toward Little Tokyo over the first street bridge from Boyle Heights, I felt the bracing power of a fiery sunset embrace me with more love than my own family gave me. The sky and the air filled me with hope, filled me with big dreams. My father only filled me with anger. One day as I was leaving my job, I heard loud taiko drums and bamboo flutes wailing away outside a temple on First and Central. A group of dancers were dancing in a big circle when she suddenly appeared. She was wearing a beautiful white silk kimono and moved and danced as free as the wind. And her face, it radiated like a Madonna. She glanced at me as she floated by, and it stopped me cold in my tracks as the beast in my heart started to dance along with the drums. There are many Japanese-American girls at Roosevelt High School, but nobody quite like her. I couldn't get her out of my mind all summer long. Okay, so how about census? And, and please put it in the chat. Um, a first person or third inciting incident. Um, I'm going to get out of share right now so I can look at it. So, um, yeah, so census, everyone. Do you remember? How did Ruben incorporate census? Sound, okay. Sound, okay, Mike. 
yeah, the sound of the taiko drums. And I think it was also um, the flute um, as well. So, um, which I, it was so appropriate because it's like this, uh, this uh, young man who's, you know, blood is pulsing and he hears the drum. So I think that was a good um, sense to spotlight. Yeah, to feel his heart be uh, beating, Marsha. And then Joy has the whole link to the whole story as well. Okay, Kevin, yeah, it was first person. Now, what was the inciting incident? Was there an inciting incident? Um, someone private messaged me, they love the radiating Madonna visual image, divine goddess like mysterious. The hearing the, the incident, his encounter with the woman, Lizzie, yes. Um, and, and this is interesting too, an anger at his father. So actually the inciting incident is the encounter with, I mean, Ruben doesn't waste any time. He goes straight, you know, and if, but there's so much in that first paragraph, we already know that he's, he has conflict with his family. He, he doesn't feel close to his father, you know, so Ruben in a very brief space just gets right to it. Now, Ruben could have constructed his short story where he had a scene before where he kind of talks about the relation, maybe some kind of conflict that he had with his father, like a scene like that. And then it moved into he was taking this walk across the bridge and then he saw this woman. And, and that, is, that is indeed the, the inciting incident that pull on his heart that takes him down this path. So sometimes, you know, it's hard to figure out what was the inciting incident, but really it was him kind of his obsession with the woman. Um, I'm going to go back to sharing my screen. Let's see. And, um, you know, so this is a love, and I'm going to get into tone. Oh, and the, yeah, the character development. I mean, we, we kind of, we know who this, who Carlos is, you know, and Bill, when we went over um, this last night, Bill was saying, oh, the title too, you kind of, it kind of sets you up there, right there, Yuriko and Carlos. So with the title too, think about how you can best represent your short story. Um, what I'm going to get into right now is because you're probably wondering what makes a short story good you know I am more of an intuitive person to tell you the truth I, I go a lot with my gut but that's not helpful to people you know <laughs> who can't look at my gut so um, I this I created this rubric my husband's an educator and those of you who are teachers you're very familiar with rubrics but when I was um, teaching this class at UCLA um, and I had to uh, put grades on papers, my husband's going, you need a rubric. I'm going, what's a rubric? And basically it sets up the expectation. What, what, like, what makes, how do we um, assess um, a piece of writing? What makes a piece of writing better than another? So I'm going to get into a few things. Now, I think in the chat, um, I think Joy will do a, a link to this rubric. So you can actually click on it and download it and, and it might help you. So we also provide this for the judges um, for them to use if they choose. Okay, one thing is voice and tone. Um, so five means perfect, you know, one means needs help. So a number five, um, voice is appropriate and consistently engaging, active voice, natural, a strong sense of both authorship and audience, authenticity. Um, and you're probably wondering, what is voice and tone? Um, so uh, it's a couple of things. You need to figure out, um, for instance, with the story segment we just saw, it's obviously kind of this love story. Um, um, I'm not a, a romance writer, so I can't write in this way. But it it's um, consistently this piece is about 
love and um, of romance between two people. So that voice and tone needs to be consistent to the whole piece. If we're writing a horror, you know, you, I mean, you could do a mashup. Certainly you could do mashup. Like, I guess that's what Twilight is, right? It's romance and then um, it's a vampire story. So it's possible, but I would say if it's this is your first short story, you might want to just select, you know, a certain kind of tone for it. Um, and voice is what really makes this story different from any other. Let's look at number three, which is kind of like the C grade. Tone is okay, but the short story excerpt could have been written by anyone, apathetic or artificially artificial, overly formal or informal. Sometimes people think, oh, you need a lot of fancy words to make a, a piece of writing good. And it's not. If you're going to be writing from a five-year-old boy's point of view, and, you know, he's a regular boy, if you suddenly, you know, use language for a much older person or someone out of his culture, it, it's not going to make sense. So you need to be consistent. If you have any questions in the chat, please put it in there and I'll, I'll go to it later. Um, another thing on this rubric is originality. So five, vivid, concrete description, simile, metaphor, irony, surprise the reader with unusual associations, breaks conventions, thwarts expectations. Um, so some of you are going, what's a simile and metaphor? And those are basically um, symbols, like for instance, um, with my Moss Arai series, for those of you who are familiar with it, I write from an older Kibe Nisei Gardner's point of view. So the, when he, even though this book is third person, it's it's pretty much told from his his eyes. So the way he looks at the world, the way he looks at things, it's going to be, he's going to compare it like, you know, um, s something that's difficult. Maybe it's like he's he's making a connection to um, fishing, you know, surf fishing and trying to bring in a perch, you know. So those kind of um, comparisons that he that a person brings into the piece kind of it, it needs to reflect who the protagonist is. Um, so two, borrows ideas or Im images from popular culture in an unreflective way. This is my pet peeve when I've taught because sometimes people, you know, they rely, we are so addicted to Netflix, you, you know, and manga and anime. And do we just take those things and we think, wow, that was so cool. I'm just going to put it in my short story. But you know what? That's someone else created that. You could be influenced by that, but you really need to go deep within yourself and find those things that only you, you know, maybe you know, you love basketball, but you also love anime and you, you have a younger brother and sister and they really bug you sometimes, you know, you, all of these things kind of mesh together and intersect and it's who you are and you need to kind of pull that out when you write. Okay, vocabulary and word choice. Um, so here, five, the best words chosen are striking but natural. Description includes unusual adjectives and action verbs. You want to have action. Um, you know, I and all of us um, have issues like the novel that I just turned in. Um, and there's programs, even with Word, you can check how many times did I use the word walk, you know, and there's a, a lot of different ways you can walk, you can stride, you can march, you know, you could lumber in. And um, if you need to use another word, we have a thesaurus that's easily, you could access on your computer. So just, um, and this is usually after you've finished your piece, kind of go back. And I'm gonna give you this great um, tip, which is actually, I, I typed it out there too. So good control of alliteration and assonance. You're probably saying, what is that? It's basically um, the musicality of what we write. It's like sometimes we use or we repeat sounds, um, either consonant or vowels, the, you know, and, and repetition 
actually in Ruben's piece, I think he used the word filled, 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 but he used it to compare his um, father's, his anger towards his father with these other things, these more positive things he felt. So repetition can work well as, as well. So um, number three, coherent. So this is like your C grade. It's coherent, but ordinary. Occasional misspellings. This is the computer age. Um, you guys, you know, when you're working in Word, you're going to see a squiggly red line underneath. Like you, you and sometimes you're, it automatically um, corrects your spelling, but it might be for another word. So you have to be careful. So this is my big tip, especially for a short story. It's only... Um, 2,500 words or less, read your short story aloud after you finish it. And by reading it aloud, you can, you'll stumble across things. You'll go, oh, I'm missing a word. Oh, that doesn't sound, you know, you, uh, very natural. So that will help you so much if you just read it aloud. And you may not want to, you may think, oh, I don't like to hear myself, but that can be, um, uh, very beneficial. Um, this is almost the end. Uh, so character development and dialogue. Um, so number five is fully realized characters, three-dimensional with conflicting motivations, speak in authentic ways. Um, so you don't, you know, the way people speak, they don't speak in full sentences. You know, they speak in fragments. What's really great is if you have like two or three characters, will you be able to distinguish who said what without a character tag, without saying mom said, or, you know, whatever. It, it, it should be so apparent who's saying that, that you almost don't e even need to identify. So number three is flat characters and dialogue that just provides information without revealing character. And again, two, my pet peeve, characters are just stolen from movies or other popular culture sources with no sense of originality. You don't want to do that. Okay, so uh, what happens after the exciting incident? Um, you just, each, each scene in this compressed short story must build upon each other. Um, you don't want to just throw in scenes for the heck of it. it. There has to be a purpose for it. It could be something that, for instance, if you have two people that are destined to be together, what usually happens? Something keeps them apart. So um, you want to build in conflict things that prevent the protagonist from getting what they want. You know, so you need that push and pull. And then you follow the characters to the climax and you don't need a happy ending. That's not necessary, necessary but some sort of resolution. Um, I'm going to take some questions to the chat. And I think a couple of people actually wrote something. So I'm going to read it. So I really want, we, okay. Bill Watanabe was actually the brainchild of this whole thing because he, he loves Little Tokyo so much and he was thinking, oh, that'd be great. We could give people money for writing about it. So that's how it kind of started. Um, so, um, and I think this will be in the chat. So for guidelines and agreement forms, go to the Little Tokyo Historical um, Society website. I think it's under current events and then but we would love for you, you have, um, I guess you have a month that our deadline is, um, our deadline is February 28th. And we would really love for you to participate. Um, a person uh, won our contest who had, this is, who had never written a short story before. There was also, and also we've had so many people, especially in our youth category, who did not win the first time around, but submitted another one and they won. And one of them um, um, is a young woman who's like a, math, a science genius, as well as a great lover of writing. And she went off to Berkeley and um, she, she actually, because of her writing, she got a $10,000 scholarship um, 
um, to go to college. And then while she was there, she um, wrote for the school newspaper. And she actually wrote, her, her name is um, Serena, Serena Kuhn, K-U-H-N. And you could find her short, winning short story on the Discover Nikkei. Um, we've had people, and this is not even a winner, who took her short story and made it into a children's book, and it was published as a children's book. So, you know, really wonderful things can happen through this. So I really hope that you can participate. Um, okay, a few people, let's see, how much time do I have? Oh, okay, I have four minutes, everybody. Um, so I'm going to um, read a couple things. Um, I was hurrying through the Japanese village plaza when I stopped at the sound of a stringed instrument. I turned and saw a woman wearing a colorful kimono playing a shamisen. Beside her was a, a most beautiful cat. The cat rubbed against the woman's leg and then scurried over to a nearby spectator, an elderly man standing by himself, enjoying what looked to be a cone of green tea ice cream. Um, what pops out at me was not even the shamisen, it was the cat. The cat was kind of the star of that one uh, which is really, I would just say, you know, let's, let's, instead of saying beautiful cat, let's get a little more description in there. Because what could be beautiful to this person may not be beautiful to another. So we need a few more um, details. But I also love the cone of the green tea ice cream. Again, a very um, concrete detail that, um, Okay, someone else wrote, a chill tingle down her spine. The brick building wasn't heated. She took a few more steps into the dimly lit interior. The deserted church is not where she wanted to be and turned to leave. Her mother was Buddhist and veered away from Union Church whenever they were in Little Tokyo. May I help you? She swivels at the sound of the question. To her surprise, the speaker was a thin man in a fedora from whom she would not have expected such a gruff voice or high-toned hat. Wow. When I, okay, you know what popped out for me? May I help you? Oh my gosh. You know, that was like, eh. so that was a very, um, I think when I went over the rubric, there was something like surprise, like that's like the cat, you know, that's like, may I help you? You're not, it's something you, you're not really expecting that comes out into the scene. And again, you know, with the character, you're, you're getting a sense of the protagonist. Um, she's not named, but she, um, her mother's boot, you know, her mother just did not feel comfortable in Union Church, um, which is kind of this interesting conflict. It also, I wonder why this woman is there, right? That's part of the mystery as well. That sounds like a great, both of those sound like great short stories. Um, and then I think we had this other piece. Okay. Okay. So this story happens at a, a chop suey restaurant. There, there were mother, mom and daughter with daughter's friend and they were uh, over the door. Of the, okay, they opened the door of the restaurant. The smell of garlic and hit, um, hint of soy sauce jumped out when three of them entered into the restaurant. There are two uh, big round tables and four small tables around an all white and they have tablecloth on set up with chopsticks and small dishes. The waiter came to invite them to the small table, giving them a menu. Oh. The black girl felt the place is very familiar for her, but she never came into this restaurant. So this character, why does she think it's familiar? I mean, this is kind of like the surprise, right? And there, yeah, so yeah, very good. Um, in the chop suey restaurant, people like chop suey, I guess. Um, I had my compa companion ask, where did your mother hide the jewels? Oh, that's the inciting moment. Okay. And then um, uh, there was a Farewell, My Lovely was also filmed at the that, uh, Far East Cafe. Um, Gracie stood in the shade of the Nishihonganji temple when she heard a baby cry. She turned and saw father carrying a baby with one hand and a worn suitcase in the other. Uh, the baby cry, you know, wow surprise what's going on and what what's with the suitcase what's you know 
what's going on here? Um, another person, the central plaza comes with the warm sense of ramen, uh, taiyaki and cuisine that makes your mouth water. And then I am a ghost. I was born when the first business person started a store here in little Tokyo. My spirit grows brighter when people congregate. I shrink when people disappear. In the year 2035, I once met a dove. That was the end of the brainstorm, but yeah. Um, so that's, whoa, ghost. So um, yeah, any other comments? We're kind of right at the end. If you have any more questions, um, kind of type it in the chat right now. Um, I know we didn't have that much time to do, but I hope, I, I guess um, from this brief session, I want the takeaway I want you all to get to have is um, to remove any blocks that you may have. Um, don't feel like I'm not good enough or because when you saw what those that rubric, we want originality. You know, what I write is not what you can write. We all have unique points of view. And so you just um, need to embrace who you are and what you can, you know, what you gravitate towards and just go for it. And um, so that's, you know, Bill, any, any final thoughts from you at this time? Uh, no final thoughts, uh, although I've always wanted to start a short story with, it was a dark and stormy night in little Tokyo but uh, I think that was already used. 